it all ties in with this axis mundi of the world, which connects us to the eternal cosmos, ever changing and yet remaining the same. Worlds coming and worlds going. This is the fabulous cosmology in the Pearl of Great Price itself, in the book of Abraham and in the book of Moses, and in the ancient Enuma Elish, one of the oldest religious texts, in the Shabako stone of the Egyptian religion. It began this connection, this axis between heaven and earth began in a pre-mortal existence and council of all of the gods and all of mankind. That's fascinating, isn't it? The atonement, as the Book of Mormon so properly taught, that was from the foundation of the world, from before the foundation of the world, because this is an infinite atonement. You don't see the beginning and the end of the axis it's infinite. It connects one infinity to another all the way through. It's a beautiful imagery here. Richard J. Clifford, one of the professors of theology at Cambridge, Massachusetts, was invited by Truman G. Madsen to contribute to the Temple in Antiquity from the BYU Religious Studies Center Group. And he discusses the Temple and the Holy Mountain, showing how the importance of the Ugaritic materials have for the Hebrew Bible is enormous, because many of the same themes occur between the Ugaritic writings and the Hebrew Bible. More, most especially the theme of the mountain as the temple of God. And so I want to discuss a little bit of how this Ugaritic conception of the mountain as the temple of God connects with the themes of temples in general and mountains in specific. It has to do with the waters of life, the tree of life, of course, and the destruction of chaos by the god El. Now, Clifford, of course, noted that the destruction of chaos by the Ugaritic pantheon of the gods is because the battles took place in the mountains. And the reason why that occurs, that's why they're called the storm gods. And that makes beautiful sense because when you look at the tops of the mountains, what do you see? Storms. Lots and lots of storms. Like, for instance, right over here. The storm's going on way up north. Well, I've seen lightning today. That's why the clouds yeah. gather on the tops of the vet mountains. Yeah. It's specifically in the Bible, Clifford says, on page 112 of his article, that Yahweh has two mountains, Sinai and Zion. And these two mountains are the same type of mountains in the Baal epic also. The, the main theme is the mountains of Siphon in the north is where the dwelling place of the deity pertains because they're the mountains of El and Baal. And Yahweh overtakes not only the storm god imagery, but the mountain god imagery also because that is where all the energy is displayed and that is where all the power over nature and chaos occurs in the mountains. 
Yahweh is the warrior. He's able to overcome the chaotic forces and as such he is celebrated as the divine king and the earthly king of course takes his place in this particular situation of discovering the sacred mountains and it's and it's incorporated into the national epic of Israel's feasts of course Yahweh is their God he is seen as moving in his residence on Sinai on the mountains that's where they belong and of course he's discussed the uh, Hebrew text discusses his tent the tent of Yahweh the tent of El because that's where the God resides as a temporary structure because he temporarily dwells on earth but his eternal place is between the bonds of heaven and earth that is up in the mountains that's why Zeus is in Olympus the same conception is in Mount Meru in India and of course it's on Sinai and Zion for the God of Israel Sinai is the mountain where God first meets Israel and its great representative Moses of course and that's the burning bush story that Clifford discusses the storm theophany is a proclamation of divine sovereignty in the ancient Near East and that is precisely why they pitched the idea that Yahweh became a storm deity because that declares his divine sovereignty over all of creation from his throne the mountain the connection of heaven and earth he is the sovereign of the earth as well as the God of Israel because he defeats the chaotic forces that fight against him and Israel. It is because of Yahweh's victory over the forces of chaos that he is declared the king of all the earth and all the universe. It establishes his sovereignty. It also establishes his right to rule over the heavens and the earth. And that's why his representative, the earthly king, is such an important pivotal figure in the National Assemblies of Israel. It's precisely for that reason. And because he has defeated the forces of chaos, he reigns in the highest place, up in the mountain, which is his temple. And that's what mountains mean.